Hey there, it's CJ Willie, and I'm cracking a pack today. I'm back with pack number 20 in my 1988 Topps Mini Leaders box. I'm trying to see how many packs I have to crack to get all 77 cards in the complete set. I've included the link to the preview video in the description below, which gives a little explanation on the set and the highlights of what I could pull in cracking these packs. Since each pack only has seven cards in it, I'll flip over the card. Well, first I'll guess what category or categories the player led their league. Then I'll flip over the card to see how very bad my memory was from the 1987 MLB season, or if I got it right. I've also created this checklist to keep track of my progress. We're on pack number 20, so I'll get that marked off. And we only have three more cards to go. Ricky Henderson, Howard Johnson, and Mike Doon. So hopefully today is the day that I'm able to complete my set. Um, I'm already, as you can see with the progress, working on my um, second set. So hopefully I can get a second set as well. Let's get rid of that Spring Fever Baseball card and get to crack in this pack. Okay, first card we have is Jimmy Key. Key uh, came up with the Blue Jays and then uh, spent most of the early or mid to late 80s with the Blue Jays. Moved on later on to the Yankees and Orioles was a pretty good pitcher uh, with Dave Steeb, really formed the backbone of the Blue Jays rotation in the mid 80s to late, you know, 80s. Uh, Key, I believe, was a league leader in victories and ERA in 1987. He was number one in ERA with 276. He was tied for uh, fifth in games started, eighth in innings, and tied for eighth in victories. A 17 and eight season with a 2.76 ERA, pretty good um, stats as the Blue Jays kind of battled the Tigers down to the wire in the American League East. Um, eventually, the Tigers, I think, took the American League East by a game. I th it was right down to the last weekend of the season. Uh, so let's get Jimmy Key marked off. Next up, we have Jose Canseco. Um, Canseco's, uh, let's see, second full year in the Major Leagues was in 1987. Um, Canseco um, didn't lead the league in home runs or RBI, I believe he was a league leader in um, doubles and maybe game-winning RBI. Yep, he was tied for second in game-winning RBI with 17. Uh, he was sixth in runs and 10th in doubles. Uh, game-winning RBI is not a stat that's tracked anymore. Uh, apparently, it was a stat back in the mid-'80s um, because with game-winning RBI, at least it was one stat that allowed Tops to include a red-hot Jose Canseco in the mini-league mini leaders set. So we get Kenseiko marked off. Next up, we have Jeff Reardon. So might as well get him marked off as we're going along. Jeff Reardon uh, was the closer for the 1987 Minnesota Twins. Um, he was a main uh, key player in their run to the World Series and then eventually their World Series championship over the 1987 Cardinals. Um, Reardon was a league leader in saves. I believe, if I remember correctly, um, he led the American League in saves that year. Uh, nope. He was tied for second with 31. Uh, he ranked second in games finished with 58 and sixth in games with 63. What's interesting about Reardon, although he saved 31 games, he had probably one of the highest ERAs of his career uh, with 446. Um, but in the World Series, he was able to stifle the Cardinal bats in a unique World Series in that the home team won each game. Unfortunately for me, the Twins had home field advantage, so they won games one, two, six, and seven, while the Cardinals swept the three games, four, five, and six at Bush Stadium. Next up, we have Ivan Calderon. Calderon um, was a power hitter with the White Sox, uh, Expos, and Mariners. Um, spent a pretty good bulk of his career you know, with the White Sox and the Expos. I believe, if I remember correctly, he did come up with the Mariners. Um, Calderon was a league leader. Uh, I don't think at this point he was hitting a ton of home runs, but I think he was a league leader in doubles. Yep, tied for third with 38 doubles. Um, just started coming into kind of his power, power hitting prowess. Uh, 28 home runs, 83 RBIs, and a 293 batting average. Unfortunately for Calderon, he passed away quite young after his playing career. Um, he was involved, I think, in an auto accident in his native Puerto Rico. Uh, Dwayne Bius, uh, or Buse with the Angels. 
um, came up um, as an older rookie. I think he was already like 20, 29, or 30 by the time he cracked the major leagues with the Angels. He spent a little bit of time as their closer, uh, just a brief period of time as their closer, mainly in the 87, 88 season. By the time the 88 season rolled around, he was done with the major leagues, although he made a very wise investment. Along with Wally Joyner, he was instrumental in getting a card contract or a contract with Major League Players Association and MLB for Upper Deck. Uh, if you Google his name, you'll read quite an interesting history. Wally Joyner decided to take a percent of the earnings from Upper Deck. Uh, no, a one-time payment from Upper Deck, if I remember right. It's like $150,000 or something like that. Buse decided to take a percentage, and it basically made him a multimillionaire. So, uh, he led the league in saves. Oh, I flipped the card over too soon. I knew he was fifth in saves with 17. It's a stat that's not very hard to forget in that there weren't a lot of saves going around in the American League, apparently, and Buse ranked fifth with only 17 saves. He finished seventh in games, finished with 44. Oh, dropped the card. All right, next up we have John Franco, who was a closer for a number of years, With came up first with the Reds, and then moved on to the Mets. Franco had a number of great um, seasons, uh, was a perennial all-star. Um, I believe he finished with over 400 career saves. I'm pretty sure I might have to check that out later. In 1987, he was a, come on, focus, he was a league leader in saves. I believe he finished, uh, this is going to text my memory, I think he finished third in saves. No, he was fourth. He had 32 saves, finished fourth in saves, ranked first in games, finished with 60, and 10th in games with 68. Um, had a very lengthy career, pitched well into the 2000s. Um, I think he ended up pitching around 20, 21 seasons. Um, okay, our final card is Brian Downing. Uh, looks like we're getting pretty close to, I know we haven't completed the first set, but we've got a lot of the second set. Uh, Brian Downing came up with the White Sox, moved on to the Angels, began his career as a catcher, um, wasn't the greatest defensive catcher, and spent the bulk of his playing career as an outfielder, and then fortunately for the American League, as a designated hitter. Um, Downing did have a little bit of pop in his bat later on in his career. Early on, he didn't have as much, so there was a lot of speculation based upon, you know, was he an early steroids user, um, because... Um, Early in his career, he averaged maybe 9, 10 home runs a season, whereas in later in his career, he could get up in the 20s and 30s. Um, Downing, I think, was a league leader, and I'm going to go with doubles and game-winning RBI. Nope, I was completely wrong. He was third in runs with 110, first in walks, and sixth in on-base percentage. Uh, 29 home runs with 77 ribbies, 272 batting average, um, about 30 doubles. Uh, Brian Downing. Uh, had, a, had a relatively lengthy career, over 200 career home runs, almost 1,000 RBI, um, and was a pretty good offensive player. All right, uh, best card out of the pack, or what I think is the fav my favorite card out of the pack, uh, I'm going to go with Dwayne Buse. Um, I think the reason why I'm going to go with Dwayne Buse isn't necessarily anything for his playing career, but as I indicated earlier, he was extremely instrumental in getting a contract for upper deck. Uh, upper Deck changed the card collecting landscape. They came out with some better premium cards, photography, etc., and really pushed the envelope. Uh, even though Upper Deck currently doesn't do baseball cards anymore, 89 was a crazy season in that when they first came out, it was a little bit tepid, lukewarm, but by the 1990 season and 1991, it was, Upper Deck was a hot commodity. And obviously, Ken Griffey Jr. getting the first card of the 1989 initial set really helped fuel the rise of Upper Deck. And Dwayne Buse, although was out of the company relatively quick, made a lot of money. I think it was like $16 million uh, from Upper Deck uh, because he was so instrumental in helping them get an agreement with the Players Union. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did like it, please subscribe and share. Also share with me in the comments what your favorite card or what you thought was the best card in the pack. Until next time when I'm back to crack the next pack of 1988 Topps Mini Leaders in my quest to complete the set.